I might, yeah. I didn't get a string, but you could ask for it. No. They, 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 they gave this to my kids and I asked for one for oh, Of course. <laughs> you have two now. Oh, no, one is... Oh, uh, just oh. <laughs> All right, guys, why don't we uh, start? So we, we're going to start a new uh, uh, lecture topic here today. Uh, Andre is going to tell us about it. Okay, so can everybody hear me fine? So, so my job is to tell you about neutrinos. I, I want to keep in mind the fact that this is the end of your third week here, and you're all still standing, more or less. So uh, uh, this will probably be a, a different style of lectures from the stuff that you've heard before. And one thing I'd like to start with, and I'll probably spend the whole time today, is uh, giving you a little bit of background about uh, the physics of, of neutrinos. Okay, so this is the goal for what I want to talk about today. So, so just to give you a, a sense of what we would like to do, so I will tell you, uh, I will give you four lectures on uh, neutrino physics. And I want to start at the very beginning just by giving you a very brief uh, history of how we got to uh, today. OK, so this is sort of topic number one. And then as a sort of a, a, an addendum to this, I want to talk about what, are, what used to be referred to as the neutrino puzzles. And uh, and this is the reason why neutrinos have gotten to be very exciting as opposed to what they used to be, say, about 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, the neutrino puzzles will allow us to understand how we know that neutrinos have mass. Okay, so this is sort of a, a, a step number two. And of course, the physics that's associated to that is neutrino oscillations. Which I saw that Maxime alluded to, so I think now I have to tell you about it. And, uh, and then of course, after we talk about neutrino oscillations, and because there are no... Uh, neutrino talks on experiments, I want to give you a sense of, uh, of uh, where we are. And where we want to go. OK, so this is uh, all of the uh, sort of giving you a sense of what neutrino physics is about today. And before we talk about that, I want to give you a sense of how we got here. And then after that, I want to talk about neutrino masses as physics beyond the standard model. And I'll try to give lots of examples of that. And if all of this works out and we make it to the end of the last lecture on Monday, uh, I, I might try to find some time to tell you about the, the, what's called the short phase line anomalies. Now, there are lots and lots and lots of neutrino topics that I will not have time to talk about very much, so people can ask. Or we can talk about this in discussion, or we can talk about it during coffee, or whatever works for you. And these are things that have to do with neutrinos in astrophysics, neutrinos in cosmology, uh, ultra-high energy neutrinos. And these are all things that I believe you have heard about, either from discussions on dark matter, or discussions on the large-scale structure of the universe, or discussions about uh, uh, other topics where neutrinos come in and, and, and play a role, including things like a direct dark matter detection and uh, stuff like that. OK, so this is the plan. And uh, so we hope we can get through all of this. And what I would like to talk to start with is uh, uh, telling you a little bit about how we got here. And uh, my goal is to talk about lots and lots of, lots of things that you've heard about before. 
because that tends to be uh, uh, good for you, and it's also good for me. And if I say anything that's wrong, you should correct me, but do it in a polite way so I don't feel very bad. <laughs> and if you do have questions, please ask. Uh, uh, life is much more exciting if you ask questions. Okay. Before I start, I, I will be using uh, the slides to show you pictures and, and things which are relatively hard to draw on the blackboard. And uh, the first thing I wanted to start with, this is a very, very biased list of uh, neutrino reviews. And they're all quite recent, and many of them are very good. And uh, so, so if, you, if this is a topic that you're interested in and you know very little about now, uh, uh, there's a lot of literature on uh, uh, describing our, our understanding of, of neutrinos today. So I, I, I invite you to take a look at a lot of this. Uh, I think some people have done a pretty good job of explaining the state of neutrino physics. One thing that's very exciting about neutrinos is that this is a very, very rapidly moving topic. So things change very quickly, which means uh, you kind of have to be paying attention, and uh, uh, it has been a very exciting 20 years or so. All right, so I want to start with a, with a brief history of the neutrino. And of course, before we talk about the history, it's important to talk about the prehistory. And I, I will tell you that this will not be a comprehensive discussion of the history of the 20th century particle physics. This will be a ridiculously cherry-picked uh, list of topics that I want to talk about. Okay, so please feel free to fill in the blanks. The other thing I will mention is uh, I am really bad with names and dates. So anything I say, I will not be able to defend. <laughs> Having said all of this, uh, the place that, that's very, very important to start is uh, actually before the 20th century. And see, I have to look up my notes. And uh, the most important date that marks the beginning of uh, lots of aspects of modern particle physics is this date here with uh, the discovery of natural radioactivity. by this uh, French person. This is a great story, and I will tell you the story that's in the textbooks. It's probably not correct, but it's a good story anyway. So I assume uh, at least uh, most of you have heard about this. So the idea is very simple. This guy was uh, studying a phenomenon called phosphorescence, is that if you expose uh, certain materials to light, they will they radiate light back again after you've taken them back into the room, let's say. So this guy was studying phosphorescence in uh, uranium salts. So these are some uh, uh, compounds that have uranium in them. And uh, the story goes that he was studying this, and, you know, and the way you do this is that you take your sample, you expose it to direct sunlight for a while, and then you see how it behaves afterwards. And of course he was doing this uh, probably in Paris. See, this is where the stuff I don't know comes into play. I'm sure it was in France somewhere. I think it was in Paris. And the weather there is often bad. See, there you go. The weather there is often bad. So the story is that he had a long spell of bad weather, and then he had to go on a trip. And for a long time, he left the sample in a drawer. And the way that he would study what the sample was doing is, was, was using these photographic plates. You know, so he would study the, the light that was coming out of this material by, by seeing what imprint it would leave on a photographic plate. So after a very long time, he found he'd left his sample inside of a drawer on top of a photographic plate. And he said, well, what am I going to do with this sample here? He had this photographic film that he thought was sort of wasted. He didn't know what was in it. He developed it, and he found out that this uh, uranium salt was emitting something that was leaving a, an imprint in the photographic plate, even when it wasn't exposed to light. And that was very surprising. So he tried this out for a very long time, and he found out that there's some materials that emit uh, uh, stuff, something that, you know, uh, generically speaking, radiation, just like electromagnetic radiation. So this is a very, very important date. It's in 1896. And once people figured this out, this opened up a huge industry of understanding radioactivity. And uh, again, I'm going to skip lots of steps. But as you know, people started learning about radioactivity. They learned about the different types of radioactivity. There's alpha radiation. There's beta radiation. And there's gamma radiation. 
You can figure out where the names come from. It's kind of obvious. And of course, uh, what happens is that they were studying this uh, radioactivity that was coming out of these uh, uh, radioactive elements, and they classified them according to properties that they had. And again, it's important to place yourself in, in those days, 1896. This is before quantum mechanics existed. Okay, so this is a long time ago. And basically, what you could do with the radiation is lots of different things. You can place it inside a magnetic field and see what happens. You can try to shield it, and that's pretty much what you can do, right? So there's some radiation that comes out of some material. So that's what people did, and they quickly found that alpha radiation had positive charge. Beta radiation has negative charge, and then gamma radiation has no charge. And of course, this is what you find if you place the radiation in a magnetic field, right? And you can kind of picture what it... So the, the experiment kind of looks like this. Here's your sample with the uranium salt. This is not really how it looks like, but it's kind of a, a cartoon, right? And then you take your photographic plate and you place it here. You put everything inside a magnetic field, and you'll notice that some of your radiation went this way, the other radiation went that way, and then some of it didn't go anywhere. It kind of didn't get into your photographic plate if you made a little hole in your sample over here. So this is uh, step number one. Step number two, of course, had to do with how easy it was to make the radiation bend. And that's a statement about whether these things have mass or not. And they figured out, for example, that the beta radiation things were very light. They were very easy to bend. Alpha radiation is much harder to bend, so it has more mass. And the gamma radiation, again, you can't study with a magnetic field. You can't make it bend. And finally, the last property, which is very important, has to do with making the radiation stop. And the idea is, uh, it turns out that alpha radiation is very easy to stop. Beta radiation is a little bit harder to stop. And gamma radiation is very hard to stop. Now, just to give you a little bit of context, so this was first discovered in 1896, and it was a big deal in sort of chemistry slash physics for a long time. I want to remind you of another very important date, which is the year after that, which is when the electron was discovered. by a J.J. Thompson, and this is something I'm sure you've heard about with cathode rays and, and stuff like that. So what we care about is radiation. Okay, this is the business where neutrinos play a very, very important role. And of course, uh, the other feature that people got good at, oh no, this is fine, is uh, they started to study other properties of this radiation. And one thing, for example, is once you get good at this, uh, you can start making really good measurements of, say, what energy does the radiation come out with. And, and, I, and again, it's very important to have a picture of what's going on here. This is a really weird phenomenon, that you have some material that spits off some, uh, uh, some stuff by itself without being uh, 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 excited in any way. It just does it. Okay? So what people figured out, for example, is that if you look at alpha radiation, oftentimes the the alpha rays that come out have a well-defined energy. You know, so there's some physics process that happens and then you emit an alpha particle. The same is most, mostly true about gamma radiation as well. The radiation we care about the most is beta radiation. And beta radiation has a very long, tortuous history in the beginning of the 20th century. And it's a very exciting history, which I won't tell you about because it's a, a long story. But the real challenge had to do with the spectrum of beta radiation. And the question that came up in the early 20th century had to do with whether beta radiation came out with a discrete spectrum or with, or with a continuous spectrum. That was the question. People made measurements uh, using these photographic plates. And the idea is more or less simple. It's the same picture that I drew there before. So you have a sample that's emitting beta radiation. You put it inside a magnetic field. And for different energies, uh, the curvature of your track will be different. right? So you put it in your photographic plate. Let's say that the beta radiation is going this way. 
and it kind of goes around and uh, it will land in all kinds of different places. So the question that people would ask is, uh, would you get here a continuous spectrum or would you get here a bunch of discrete lines? Okay. And again, what people expected very naively is that you would probably get a bunch of discrete lines. Now, why would people expect that? Uh, there are different reasons for this. Uh, uh, a, a psychologically important reason was that this is what spectra look like. You take a spectrum, you get a bunch of lines. Sometimes it's very dense, right? So you've all done experiments with lines. And sometimes it's kind of dense and it's messy and so on. But you expect a discrete spectra because, you know, spectra are discrete. That's what they do. And I do want to say that experimentally, they weren't sure if the spectra were discrete or continuous for about 15 years. It was a very, very difficult experiment. These are not state-of-the-art experiments anymore. These are very crude experiments to do, and there are all kinds of experimental issues you have to worry about. And it took, I think it was in 1914, a very young guy called the Chadwick. He was the one who did a series of experiments that convinced everybody that the spectrum that you measured of uh, uh, beta decay was continuous. And they were very sure about that. So he did a really good experiment, and he convinced everybody, this is really what's going on. You have these continuous spectra. And uh, people were very unhappy about this. So it took them a long time to understand whether this was actually what was going on or whether this was an experimental artifact of the way that you were making the measurement. And uh, people, had, people were getting good at doing experiments. And the idea is, so imagine that you have a model, and the model tells you that your spectrum is supposed to look like this. So this is number of hits as a function of energy, and this is the energy resolution of your detector. And then you go out and you make a measurement and you get something that looks like that. So the question is, what happened? Okay. And the first really obvious answer is that you have losses somewhere, which makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, you have this uh, beta ray that wants to come out of some sample, and it has to grind its way out in order to get it, you know, in order to get to your detector, and that probably has some losses associated to it. And people wrote down lots of models about that. What's really exciting is the fact that very, very clever experimental people convinced everybody that this was not the case, that the losses in the experiments uh, uh, were not responsible for uh, the shape of the spectrum that you had. You can do this in a variety of ways. Uh, you can make very, very thin targets, and you can measure the spectrum as a function of the thickness of the target. Uh, you can tr try to get information about whether your target, you know, in quotes, heats up because the radiation is heating it up as it's coming out. And by making a series of measurements, they figured out that that was not what was going on. Okay? So we were stuck with this continuous spectrum, and it looks like it was the fundamental spectrum that looked like that. Okay? In the meantime, people were hard at work figuring out what these physics processes were, because, you know, that's what people do. So you figure out very quickly, for example, what alpha radiation is. That's when a nucleus uh, uh, morphs into a different nucleus by spitting out a helium, ad, a helium nucleus. So people figure that out, which is part pretty impressive. And then, of course, they figured out that what happens in a beta radiation process is that uh, you're actually, your nucleus is spitting out an electron. So you quickly draw a model that says, here's my model. There's some process that I don't understand. But on the other hand, it doesn't look very different from other radiative processes like, say, gamma, gamma radiation emission or alpha radiation emission, where you have a nucleus that transforms into a different nucleus and spits out an electron. That was a very good model, okay? This model makes a prediction. And again, this is a two-body decay. And as everybody here knows, uh, when you have a two-body decay, the energy and the magnitude of the momentum of the electron that comes out is completely well-defined. 
you don't have a choice, you can make a prediction. Given the masses of these nuclei, what is the energy that the electron comes out with? And it comes out with a, a well-defined energy. Okay? So clearly, uh, there's something fundamentally wrong about our understanding of what's going on here. Okay? So this is what was going on, and this is a situation in the 1920s. So by the 1920s, people knew all of this information at the same time. At the same time, people were trying to figure out what nuclei were, which is very difficult. So as you might remember, people knew that atoms had nuclei by then, and uh, they knew that nuclei uh, were not fundamental objects, but they were compound objects. They had substructure. And it's easy to see why it has substructure, because it can do stuff like that. Right? So that's kind of a, a one sign that there's some substructure in this nucleus. So people constructed a really good model. And uh, this is a nuclear physics in the 1920s. And again, I will say this a lot of times, but you want to place yourself in those days when people were understanding what quantum mechanics was. You know, it wasn't like they could go to school and take an undergraduate class in quantum mechanics and learn all the weirdness of quantum mechanics. These were grown-up people that were very uncomfortable with quantum mechanics to begin with, and then they had to figure out how nuclei worked. But the model was pretty simple. You have a nucleus N, and you say, well, you know, we know that these nuclei have uh, uh, pieces to them. So uh, the pieces that I know about are protons. So this nucleus has some protons in it. And I also know that nuclei can spit out electrons. So there must be electrons around as well. And this is my model for how a nucleus works, to zero order. And then there's some unknown interactions that keep those things together. And then every once in a while, uh, uh, a subset of these elements can, can leave the nucleus via some interaction that I don't understand yet. And at other times, these electrons can be kicked out, and that explains all of these physics processes. So a very good model. So that means, for example, that helium-4, which is the, the alpha radiation, that was made out of four protons and two electrons. Okay, and that works out really well. Now, there are a bunch of other nuclei. So the, the one that's famous to talk about is nitrogen-14. And again, you know, if you follow this model, nitrogen-14 then was made out of 14 protons and 7 electrons. So that's a pretty good model. Except that this is a very disturbing model uh, for the following reason. If you, if you use your vast knowledge of nuclear physics, which is the same as mine, which is very little, uh, nitrogen-14, as, as we understand it, has uh, seven protons and seven neutrons. It has an even number of fermions in it, so it's a boson. It has an integer spin. This collection here has an odd number of fermions. Uh, and they all have spin a half. People already knew that. So that means that whatever this thing here is, it's a fermion. So that's great, because now... You have a model that makes a prediction, and the prediction is that nitrogen-14 is a fermion, which turns out to be wrong. So here's another problem. Uh, nitrogen-14 is a boson. It's not a fermion. It doesn't have half-integer spin. So how do we understand that? And this is a big problem. So this is where people were in the 1920s, and uh, they thought really hard about this. Now, to add an insult to injury, there's another problem. Uh, which one? This one is a little bit more subtle, but it's probably easy to understand as well. It has to do with magnetic moments. So, as I am sure you know, the magnetic moment of a fermion that has charge Q. Uh, is proportional to the charge divided by the mass. As you probably also know, there's, then there's h-bars and c's and stuff like that. 
And as you know, people spend a lot of, you know, it was another big mystery to understand the proportionality constant, which is this uh, G factor. But in the case of a, of a, a point like fermion, it was two. In the case of the proton, I'll, I'll get this one wrong, it's like five. And for the neutron, it's minus four or minus six. I just forget which way it goes. Uh, but it's proportional to this anyway. Okay? What this means is the magnetic moment of the electron is way bigger than the magnetic moment of the proton, regardless of the proportionality constant, just because the electron is so light. So now you look at your model for nuclei, and you make the prediction that, again, magnetic moments of these things will be nominated by the electrons, because they have a huge magnetic moment compared with the protons. So they should dominate the calculation of the magnetic moment. You could get unlucky, and maybe these electrons can be aligned in the wrong way so that their contribution to the magnetic moment cancels out. But again, if you have an odd number of them, you can't do that. But it turns out that the magnetic moment of nuclei is about the same as the magnetic moment of the proton, and it's way smaller than the magnetic moment of the electron. Okay? So this is where we were in the 1920s. There are all these things. We have a model, this model, which does lots of things well. It explains a lot of phenomena, so it's not a stupid model. But it makes a lot of very, very weird predictions, okay, which are just completely incorrect. And uh, these were very exciting times in, in, in fundamental particle physics because you could extrapolate as much as you wanted. And one thing which was very exciting was, so you have this beta spectra, which are wrong, and then you have these uh, wrong statistics, you know, fermions behaving like bosons and vice versa. And then you have the electrons not contributing to the magnetic moment. So one hypothesis that was uh, very popular at the time, and my computer died just now, or it'll, it'll come back. One hypothesis that got to be very popular was uh, that, you know, these, uh, these electrons here are weird. Electrons and nuclei are weird. Okay, how weird are they? They have different statistics. They have a different magnetic moment. And they can violate uh, energy momentum conservation, which is very weird. And uh, one thing which I like to show, so I'm going to skip some stuff, is uh, this quote here at the bottom. Uh, this is uh, extracted from a textbook. So this is a textbook in nuclear physics that was published in 1931. And it says, you know, that, you know, the beta spectra mean that energy and its conservation fails uh, when you talk about the emission of nuclear electrons. Now, this sounds weird, but he says, this does not sound improbable. If we remember, that these electrons were very weird, okay? And this was uh, the state of the art at the time. Okay. What's that? Mm. Oh, excellent. Okay, so that, that I, I can easily believe that, yes. Okay, good. I will, I, will, I will remember to take a look at it. But this is where we were. And, uh, and the solution to all these problems is the neutrino, as I'm sure you know. So if we leave the prehistory, you have sort of the early days of neutrinos. And of course, uh, uh, the, the monumental event is in 1930, I think it's in December, where uh, uh, Pauli uh, invents the neutrino. Okay, so this is a very, very famous event. And uh, the idea is really, really simple, okay? So what you want to do is you take your model for nuclear physics and you make it more complicated. So theorists are good at doing that. 
And you do it in the following way. You say that inside of the nucleus, not only you have protons, but you also have electrons, and you have some other stuff that's neutral, because the charge part of your model worked really well, so we're not going to screw that up. So this has to be neutral. It has to be pretty light, because again, the protons account for most of the mass of your nucleus. And whatever this is, it has to have a spin a half to have the spin statistics theorem work. This model doesn't explain the magnetic moment problem. So we're going to ignore that problem. So we can do that. We're theorists. So this is our model now. And this, of course, explains the beta radiation as well. Because now you say that beta radiation really is a process where a nucleus, so this is convenient, converts into another nucleus, emits an electron in the neutrino, and uh, that explains why the electron doesn't have the energy that you think it's supposed to have, because that energy got shared with, with this other particle. Okay? Now, of course, you're writing down a model. Now you have to do the phenomenology of the model. And there are lots of things you have to make sure. You have to make sure that this thing hasn't been seen yet, because otherwise your model's ruled out. So that's a statement about how this thing interacts, what kind of a mass it has. And uh, that's what Pauli did. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on the story, which is a great story. But this is what people know very well. So uh, uh, I will tell you an abridged and properly partially incorrect version of the story. There was a conference going on that Pauli was going to present this result, or, or had the opportunity to present this result. Instead of doing that, he wrote a letter that he sent via his friend to read in the conference. Because he said he wasn't going to be able to make it because he had to go to a party. <laughs> I think the party part was correct. <clears throat> but this is the letter. It, it's a fantastic text to read. It's very, very short. And basically, he says lots of really important things. I'll let you read it at your own leisure, and you can read it at home. Again, it says that it solves all kinds of problems. It solves the spin statistics problem. One thing which I always like to say is that if you're Pauli, you want the spin statistics theorem to be correct. Although he calls it the alternation law. It conserves energy and momentum, which is a big deal. And then he goes on to do the phenomenology. And uh, that's what's happening in the first paragraph. And the phenomenology says that that's the kind of mass that this particle has. The fact that you can't stop it very easily because we would have seen it stop somewhere before. And uh, the second paragraph is the more philosophical one, where he's explaining why he's not doing this in person at the conference. Some people say he was sort of ashamed to do it in person. I don't personally believe that, but that's to be debated, I suspect. He also says that he understands that what he's doing is uh, kind of silly. And that's why he says this is sort of a desperate way out. because And he feels bad because he's inventing a new particle just to solve a physics problem. And worst of all, it's a new particle that I don't think, that he doesn't think you can detect. <laughs> and he felt really bad about that. <laughs> so we've come a long way. <laughs> and uh, so this was the idea. It was an absolutely fantastic idea. And it turns out to be correct. You know, it's always nice to have ideas which are correct. OK, so this is in 1930. Uh, a curious thing happened a little bit after that, in 1932. Again, a Mr. Chadwick. He discovered the neutron. Now, one thing I should have pointed out, which I forgot, is, of course, the name of the particle that Pauli invented is the neutron. Because it doesn't have any charge. It's an obvious name. Why would he invent any other name? You know, people were not that creative back then. So, Chadwick discovered a neutral particle in, you know, a fantastic series of experiments in England. And it was a neutral particle. And it really changed the way that we understand nuclei in a very, very qualitatively, very dramatic way. And this was way after this neutrino was invented. 
So this is really exciting. Now, of course, people in the know knew that this thing here had absolutely nothing to do with this particle here. So a very famous story, which, and that one is true, I've seen uh, uh, excerpts of that, is uh, I just don't remember the initial conditions. So Pauli was either giving a talk or he was talking to reporters or somebody asked him, and, uh, and then somebody asked him, so is this particle that Chadwick discovered Pauli's neutron? And then Fermi, on, Fermi said, no, 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 it can't be because the neutron that Chadwick discovered is really heavy. The neutron that Pauli proposed is really light. It's a very small light particle. And of course, Fermi spoke Italian, and this was in Italy. So he said, you know, it's actually a small neutral particle, which is a neutrino, because that's what small stuff means in Italian. What I like to always point out, especially to theory audiences, is uh, this uh, eno suffix has gotten out of hand. <laughs> And nowadays, we associate it to any new fermion that we invent, especially in supersymmetry. And they're not light or small. They're actually <laughs> usually very heavy. But this is where this word comes from. And it was uh, baptized by Fermi. And again, we're stuck with that. It's a very interesting word. Now, of course, what comes after that is uh, something that Fermi did, which is very, very important. So this is in 1934. And that's a Fermi wrote down a theory. A theory for weak interactions. And this is a really, really big deal. This is a very bold theory that does things that we hadn't done before. And I will remind you what that theory looks like. So again, uh, people constructed a model for how weak interactions happen. How does beta decay occur? And that's the process that you learn. It's a neutron that turns into a proton, an electron, and the neutrino. And we like to call this guy the anti-neutrino, so I'm going to stick to that notation. Okay. So what Fermi did was to write down uh, this process here in terms of a mathematical formula. And he says, uh, he was inspired by electromagnetism, and he said, okay, the way that this works is some interaction Hamiltonian that is given by some coefficient g, which we now call the Fermi constant, up to a stupid factor of square root of 2 for magic reasons that I can't remember now. And then you have something that looks like that. So this is a current and then you have another current, and I'll probably get the sign wrong. I think this looks right. So this is the physics process that we have. So what we have then is a proton-neutral current, and then we have an electron-neutrino current. Okay, and the way that you interpret this process is to say that a neutron, so there's a physics process that can transform a neutron into a proton, and that can create an electron antineutrino pair. Okay? And this is a qualitatively different idea. I think this is, and I could be wrong, but I think this is the first time where we have a, a physics operation that can change particle type. And this is a pretty big deal. We had already gotten used to the idea of creating particles out of energy. We knew how to create photons, for example, and we had a theory for that. We also knew at the time, I hope, I, maybe I'm violating causality, but we probably also knew how to create, say, a plus e minus pairs. That also comes from the electron current. So we knew how to do that. And, and again, these people are very smart. The Dirac equation is from the late 1920s or like 1930. And this is just four years after that. But somehow, so he wrote down this theory, which has this absolutely crazy idea that there is a physics process that can change the type of particle. And again, we're not impressed by that because we're accustomed to it. But this is a very different idea to have in the 1930s. Which one? Oh, that was fine, yeah. 
Oh, you mean whether people knew about that? That's, uh, that took a little bit longer. P bars are harder to, to, to produce. Positrons are a little bit easier. But again, that's not a problem because this is a, we knew about the concept of the antiparticle and we knew that you could destroy or create particle-antiparticle pairs. So that concept had already been absorbed by the community, let's say. What's qualitatively different here is the particle change, you know, that the identity of the particle can change, which is very important, and it leads to all kinds of interesting ways of understanding nuclear physics as well, which I'm not going to talk about at all. But this is what he wrote down. This is the Fermi theory. This is the Fermi constant. It's still around. It's measured quite well. And uh, what this here also allowed people to do was to calculate something. What's nice about having a theory is that you can make a calculation. And in particular, you could calculate. So if this is the physics process where the neutrino gets produced, then I can also calculate how do I detect this particle. And I know that they get produced by this process here. That means I can do a scattering process like that. And that has a non-zero cross-section. Okay? And now I have a theory. That means I can calculate something. Okay? Now, one thing which I didn't talk about is the, the nature of this interaction. So I wrote down some gammas here. This gamma is some combination of uh, uh, gamma matrices. So it's either 1, or gamma 5, or gamma mu, or gamma mu gamma 5, or sigma mu nu, or any combination of those. And uh, if you're into the history of science, it took about 20 years to figure out what the right current was. Literally 20 years. It, it was very, very hard, because the experiments were hard and the theorists had prejudices, and the experiments changed, and it was a big mess. So it took a very long time to figure out that this was the famous uh, V minus A interaction. But for a really long time, it was like a scalar, pseudo-scalar, you know, tensor type of interaction, and everybody was very sure that that was the answer. And that turned out to be wrong. And uh, this, it's an interesting theoretical story I think it's the only joint paper by Gelman and Feynman that talks about this. They didn't get along, as you may have heard. And apparently they had the idea at the same time. And so this is probably not true, but the idea is that they had the idea at the same time. And then the, like the, the president of Caltech told them that they had to write a paper together and not fight it out. I'm sure this is wrong. The president of Caltech doesn't care about whether Feynman and Gelman get along. Actually, maybe he did care. But anyway, but the point for us is... Uh, now we have a, a physics process that we can calculate. I, I, I was going to say, and in parallel and a little bit before, Marshak and, and Sudarshan had a similar or the same idea, and they were trying to go around the country telling everybody about that. That's what I understand. And depending on who you talk to, uh, the, the reference frame is a little bit different about who had the idea first and so on and who influenced whom. But I don't want to get into that because I don't have enough uh, uh, real information. I only have a hearsay type information. But again, th the key point is that now you know how to detect neutrinos. In principle, people did the calculation, and the cross-section was ridiculously small. It's a very easy calculation, especially at the order of magnitude level. You basically just have to know what that number is. And you can even guess. You probably, everybody should know what the Fermi constant is. It's a very important number, okay? It's like 1 over the Higgs Vev squared. We all know what that number is. And uh, with that number, you can calculate the cross-section. And when people did this calculation, it was obvious that there was no way you were ever going to be able to observe this because this is just ridiculously small. Again, there are all kinds of bets that happen in the community. And uh, let me see if I don't forget anything. So that, that's... So people were unhappy, but at least they had a, a goal to shoot at. Okay, so let me change gears a little bit, because as far as the neutrino is concerned, nothing too exciting happened for about 20 years. But other interesting stuff was happening in particle physics, which is important for us. Oh, here's one. Okay, 
So uh, another exciting thing that happened was in 1935, people were trying to understand how nuclei exist. So there's some interaction that binds nuclei together. So there's a very smart idea by Yukawa. And he said that protons and neutrons would interact via the exchange of some particle. And because we had some understanding of this interaction between protons and neutrons, we knew, for example, what its range was. You could figure out what the mass of that particle was. And what he invented was a particle that he called a meson, which had a mass of about 100 MeV. OK, so why is it called a meson? I, I can tell you what I think the answer is. Nobody knows this. Maybe what I'll say is wrong, so Tom can correct me. It's called a meson because its mass is sort of in between the proton and the electron mass. It's kind of in the middle. Again, not a very creative name. But that was the name, and that's because the mass was about this value. Okay? And then, again, one of those really exciting things in particle physics. This was in 1935. A little bit more than a year after that, people studying cosmic rays found a meson. That was really exciting. So there's a meson was found. The mass was 106 MeV, which is really impressive. And it's wrong. So that's what's really exciting about this. So people got very, very confused because they had no idea how this discovery happened. And the idea was these were things which were produced in cosmic rays. So there's some react we knew about cosmic rays. That happened also in the beginning of the 20th century. So there's interactions going on in the atmosphere. Some of them were very high energy. They produce new particles. That's how we discover the positron, for example. And then if you put a detector on the ground, you measure this new particle that had that mass. But then you learned everything that you knew about Yukawa meson, and there was no way that particle could have made it to your detector from the atmosphere. It just was not possible. Yeah. Oh, that's from the range of the nuclear interactions. So the idea is this. He wrote down a Yukawa interaction that you learn in, say, quantum mechanics. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a Yukawa potential, some e to the minus, uh, some exponential over e to the minus a r over r. That number a is the range of the interaction. It has units of mass. That's the mass. So from the range of the nuclear interactions, that's how he wrote that down. It's an amazing theory. It's strongly coupled, so you can't calculate anything. But it's a great theory, and, and it explains lots of things. So this particle here was a big problem because uh, we weren't supposed to have detected it, but it kind of had the right mass. So it took a very long time to figure this out. So I think it was in the late, in the mid 40s, I wrote the rate. So there's uh, 1947. There's something called the two meson hypothesis. I think this is Bethe and Marshak. I don't think they were working together, but I could be wrong about that. And the idea was to say that there are actually two mesons. There's Yukawa's meson that then decays into this one. That's the idea, a very simple idea, and that turns out to be correct. Okay. Now, there's a fun part of this, which I guess people don't know anymore, but it used to be, if you talk to people of a certain age, they will refer to the muon as the mu meson. That makes absolutely no sense at all. Muons are not mesons. You all know what mesons are. Muons are not that. But that's why the muon is called the mu meson, because it, it happened in this story here. So again, these particles are the pions. This particle that was discovered was the muon. And of course, a little bit after that, the real pion was discovered in a cosmic ray experiment that was done way up high in, you know, in a very, very high place. I think the first measurements were done in the Pyrenees. And then there's a, a 
measurements that were done after that in Bolivia. And I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but I'm sure measurements were done in the Pyrenees and in Bolivia. And that was a Nobel Prize experiment. The, the spin of the mu one was measured eventually, but not, not at this point, no, not at all. That would have been a big giveaway that, that that was just not the right particle. Okay, so that's where we are. So there's a, so the reason I care about this is that, uh, so a little bit after that, people figured out that the pi on decays into a muon with the right sign, and the neutrino as well. Okay, so, so just to finish off the stories. Oh yeah, okay, so that was, that's the end of that story. Okay, so now we're in the 1940s. Okay, that's not so bad. Yeah, I'm getting to that. See, that's the, yeah, we, yeah, we want to get there. No, that's an excellent point. All right, so now we've gotten to the 1940s. Now we remember this reaction here, and we remember how hard it is to make this measurement. So, uh, the Fermi theory is from the 1930s, and now people have gotten to the 1950s. And the cross-section for measuring neutrinos is still very small. It didn't change. So the question is, what changed? Why, why did something interesting happen that allowed you to do this? Yeah. Yeah, the war. So the Second World War happened. That was a big event. It occupied people for a very long time. Except maybe Bete and Marshak, who were doing other stuff. So, and, and this is the really big deal. Basically, what happened was people invented atomic bombs, and it turns out that atomic bombs are ridiculous sources of neutrinos. The fluxes that you could get out of atomic bombs or atomic related processes was ridiculously large. So the hope is that you can make up for the really tiny cross-section with a really big flux. And that's exactly what people got involved in. So, oh yeah, so this is the next slide I want to show. So basically, what happens then is in 1956, and, and, and it's important to keep numbers in mind just for the, your own uh, education. The, the Pauli letters from 1930, and uh, it's only in 1956 that we actually get to do an experiment where we can see the neutrino hitting something. It's 26 years. It's a really long period of time. Pauli had a bet that it was impossible to detect neutrinos, which he lost. And I think it was like a case of champagne or something like that. But I'm pretty sure he was happy anyway. So this is when the neutrinos are discovered. And this is an experiment by Rhinus and Cowan in the United States. Uh, this is a big campaign to measure neutrinos. Uh, there's a component of that uh, that's referred to as Project Poltergeist. That's true. That's the name of the project. And there's one anecdote about this, which is uh, the first proposal that they made was this one. This is a really cool experiment that we never did. But this is the proposal. This was a proposal to uh, 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 Los Alamos at the time. And the idea is, remember, nuclear explosions emit a lot of neutrinos. A lot. So this is the idea. You have a nuclear explosion that's happening here. Remember, this is in the 50s. Nuclear explosions are happening left and right. <laughs> so nuclear explosion happens here. And then you mount your detector to measure the neutrinos that are coming out of your nuclear explosion. There are some problems. <laughs> the biggest problem is that there's an explosion going on at the same time you're trying to make the measurement. <laughs> OK? That's true. So that's a problem. It's a huge problem, because your detector doesn't like that. So they had a really clever idea, which is really clever, but they never tried it out. So, this is a, so they have a lot of shielding here for obvious reasons. <laughs> so they have their detector up here. And the idea is the following. So the explosion happens. When the explosion happens, uh, you let your detector fall. OK, why do you do that? 
because it's falling. So if the ground is shaking and, and all hell is breaking loose, your detector doesn't feel that. So it collects the data during that time, and then it falls into uh, feathers and foam rubber, as you can <laughs> see here. And that's how you make the measurement. So this, uh, this proposal got some encouragement, but then they had a much more clever idea, is that at the same time, you know, while we invented nuclear bombs, we invented nuclear reactors as well. And if you remember, a nuclear reactor is kind of like a controlled nuclear explosion, which is good. And it also emits a lot of neutrinos. It's not as many as an, uh, an atomic exp explosion instantaneously, but the nuclear reaction uh, allows you to take data for a very long time. Okay, so this is the experiment that they set up. And they had lots of very clever ideas along the way. Again, this is what you want to measure. So it's an electron neutrino comes in, it hits a proton, electron antineutrino comes in, hits a proton, it converts into a positron and a neutron. So if you want to measure that, what you do is you have to set up an experiment that can see this electron. You also need a lot of mass, so you need a lot of material. So you basically need a clever mechanism that will allow a positron to be produced inside a relatively dense environment. So that positron is not going to go very far. It'll hit something, probably an electron. They would annihilate, and then they will emit radiation, and you can measure that. So you can see the positron, and basically what you detect is not really the positron. You detect the positron that will move around. It will hit an electron and produce uh, uh, gammas, and that's what you detect. Now the real challenge is there's a lot of stuff that looks like this. And remember, your cross-section is still really small. And these are big experiments. Uh, so making the experiment bigger doesn't necessarily help because your backgrounds also go up with the size of the experiment. So the way that you get around that is by doing lots of things. You, do, you can do a lot of shielding. So basically, other stuff that will look like this are cosmic rays and stuff which is related to cosmic rays. So you can try to shield things as much as possible and do all kinds of clever stuff. And what they did is uh, they also noticed that there is a neutron that's produced in this reaction. So if you pick the right nucleus for your target, uh, you can get a neutron that comes out. And they found out that inside of that material, the neutron had a characteristic time that it would move around before it would eventually capture in some nucleus, which would then lead to some excited nucleus, which would then uh, decay via gamma radiation. So that means that the neutron also moves around. It combines with some nucleus, giving you some excited nucleus, which then gives you some gamma. So you have another signal that's also electromagnetic radiation that you know how to measure. But you also know how much time it takes for this neutron to get captured. So basically, the really clever idea was the following. You would get a signal that you would interpret was the positron that you're looking for. And then you would wait a known amount of time. And then you would ask, do I get another signal immediately at, at exactly that time window? And if you did, then that was a good candidate for a neutrino. And if you didn't, it was a good candidate for uh, uh, some background that was coming into your experiment. Okay. The reason I mention this, of course, is that we still do this exactly in this way in today's uh, uh, reactor neutrino experiments. The technique is exactly the same. The detectors are kind of exactly the same. They're just bigger and better and more impressive. But the physics that, that's making the detection is exactly the same. So that's very important. And uh, this is what these people did. And that's why they got the Nobel Prize after a really long time. But that's a different story. Ah, that's an excellent question. Why do you think that is? It's because it's 1 over alpha. Well, why, yeah, why, why do you There's no reason. <laughs> <laughs> they, they had to pick something, so they picked a, a, a nice number. The, the even more evil, this is in feet. So this should have just been rejected outright because it's using the wrong units. But yeah, so this is just for fun. They had absolutely no good reason for that. 
It's true, yeah, that's a very, I forgot to mention that. Okay, so we've discovered this neutrino, and uh, where are we now? So sorry, I, I don't know. This was in 1956. Uh, a couple of other important things about measuring neutrinos is, uh, so uh, there are two more things I want to mention, or three more things I want to mention. Okay, so the, the next thing that happened was in uh, 1958. This is uh, the neutrino helicity was measured. Now, this is not an experiment of the type that you get to detect the neutrino but you get to infer the neutrino properties from making other measurements. It's kind of like uh, measuring beta decay and trying to learn about the neutrinos. So this is an experiment by Goldhaber et al. I'm pretty sure it was done at Brookhaven. It's a very clever experiment. And the idea is the following. They found some nucleus and, and I hope I don't screw this up, but this is kind of the idea. So they found some nucleus. It was a metastable nucleus. And I always get the names wrong. It was a europium-152, these nuclei that nobody cares about. So you start out with this nucleus here. And this nucleus here decays by electron capture. What that means for people who don't remember, remember this is an atom. There's a bunch of electrons around. There's some nuclei that can eat the electrons and turn into a different nucleus. So it will eat a, a 1s electron. And what happens is, uh, if you'll know your periodic table, I noticed there isn't one here, which is not nice, but we'll survive. Uh, this, uh, the weak interactions will transform this into samarium. I bet you didn't know that. I don't even know what samarium looks like. But you go into samarium, and you go actually go into some excited state of samarium, that ha that, and then that immediately decays by emitting a, a photon. And the idea is if you look at this, this samarium would be in the ground state. It would emit a neutrino, and it emits a photon. That's the physics process. This guy happens to be a spin zero particle. It's eating up a 1s electron, so there's no angular momentum here. The ground state of samarium is magically also spin zero. And uh, the photon and the neutrino end up coming out back to back. You can convince yourself of that because most everything here is very light. So what happens is uh, by looking at you know, angular momentum conservation, if you measure the helicity of the photon, it's correlated with the helicity of the neutrino. OK? So that means that if this photon comes out uh, with its spin, you know, uh, with helicity that way. That means that the neutrino has helicity this way. And if the photon comes out with helicity this way, then the neutrino has helicity that way. Why do we know that? Because the, in the initial angular momentum is only the electron, which is a spin a half particle. They mostly would come out back to back. You could convince yourself that the physics of the reaction was such that for the majority of the time, they would come out back to back. They don't have to. They don't have to. And you have to read the paper to understand why. And I did read the paper, and I didn't fully understand why. <laughs> That's why I said you should think about it, because I don't know. But you're, you're correct. They don't have to come out back to back. Uh, there could be some uh, recoil, for example, and that has enough momentum. Just a little bit of recoil has, is enough to screw things up. It had to do with, uh, with the fact that this is happening through some intermediate state that was decaying very quickly. And that's when I kind of got lost in the paper. So if anybody can add wisdom to this, I'd be happy to learn. No? OK. So we'll, we'll talk about this more. But this is important. And that's why the measurement is kind of bad. The measurement is very good, but you have to interpret it. But the idea is the following. So by measuring the helicity of the photon, you would get some information about the helicity of the neutrino. And it turns out that all of the photons that you measured were left-handed. That's not true, but that's kind of the message. So that, that told you that neutrinos are produced always in a left-handed state. 
Nowadays, we know this in a variety of different ways. We know this, for example, from pion decay. If you have pion decay and you produce muons, the muons are always with the wrong helicity, the helicity that they don't like to have because it's a weak interaction process. And the reason for that is that they don't have a choice. The, the, the neutrinos are always with a well-defined helicity coming out from that. That's exactly right, yeah. That, that we know how to measure. So again, that was a very, very clever, very, uh, very important experiment. All right. So the last two things I'm going to talk about is to tell you that we know that there are more neutrinos than just the electron neutrino. And that comes back to the pion that we were talking about. And uh, OK, so I, I have time to tell you another great story in particle physics, which goes back to the muon. So the muon is a really nice particle. So again, let's remind ourselves. So the muon, the muon is kind of like the electron. It has a mass, which is about 106 MeV. But otherwise, it's uh, very much similar to the electron. You've all heard this story before, but maybe you don't know this particular detail. There's a very famous quote in particle physics. That's a who ordered that? Did you ever hear about that? That's very important. And that was, that was said after people figured out what the muon was. When people figured out that the muon is just like the electron, but it's heavier, then uh, this guy, Robbie, said, so who ordered that? Which is, that's not good for anything. That makes absolutely no sense. But nonetheless, it exists, and it still exists. And we still don't know who ordered that. But this is the muon. And uh, people thought very hard about the muon for a very long time. And one really obvious idea is, and people were very good at this, they knew about excited nuclei. So if you have an excited nucleus, that nucleus can de-excite by emitting gamma rays. So they said, aha, so maybe the muon is an excited electron. You know, that sounds very plausible. That means that the muon has to do this. So we look for it. And it didn't happen. So that was disappointing. So at the time, people figured out how the muon decays. So the muon decays much like neutrons decay. It's a, a Fermi interaction. So the muon actually decays this way. It decays into an electron and two neutrinos. So then people said, aha, I know that if the muon decays this way, then I can write down a higher order diagram. So this is the decay process, a muon, electron, neutrino, antineutrino. I can close a loop with the neutrino and the antineutrino. I can put a photon somewhere. So the muon has to decay this way. And I'm, I'm clever now. I even know how to calculate the rate at the time with large error bars. But you got an, uh, that the lifetime of the, of the branching ratio for the muon to decay this way was like 10 to minus 4, which is a pretty small branching ratio. By the 50s, we were sure this was smaller than like 10 to minus 7. So why doesn't the muon do this? I mean, it, it's, it's begging to do it. But somehow that doesn't happen. The solution to this was something called the two neutrino hypothesis. And that's to say the muon doesn't do this because there's a conserved quantity, which I will call lepton flavor number. So, and I will say the muon has lepton flavor, has muon number, the electron has electron number, and that's why this process doesn't happen. But then you say, no, but the muon knows how to do this. So how do you conserve this uh, muon number and electron number? The way that you do that is that you say that this neutrino here has muon number, and this neutrino here has electron number, which is opposite to the electron. That's why it's the antineutrino, in such a way that the muon number and the electron numbers are conserved. 
And that explains why you can't close down this loop, because these are different particles. And that's called the two neutrino hypothesis. It was invented to explain why muon doesn't go to E gamma. So now the question is, how do you test that? And that's where the other really big development in, in neutrino experiment happened, which was we figured out how to make a neutrino beam. And the idea goes back to pions. So you have a pion. We know it decays into a muon and a neutrino. If you believe in this uh, muon number hypothesis, the pion has zero muon number. So this neutrino here better have muon number to cancel out the anti-muon number of the anti-muon. Okay, so this is the process that you get. So, if you look at this neutrino here, and you make it hit something, what neutrinos do when they hit something is to produce a charged lepton. And of course, it has two choices. It can either produce a muon plus something else, or it can produce an electron plus something else. If this two neutrino hypothesis is correct, you better be able to do this experiment and never ever get to see an electron. Okay? And this is really exciting because electrons are lighter than muons. So kinematically speaking, they're easier to produce. So if this neutrino was indifferent to the nature of the charged lepton it was going to produce, it would be much happier producing electrons. So this is the experiment that you have to perform, and that's what people did. So there's a famous experiment that's also a Nobel Prize winning experiment for the discovery of the second neutrino by Letterman, Steinberger, and Schwartz. Uh, Schwartz was the most important person. He was the leader of that experiment. Uh, uh, Letterman and Steinberger are probably better known names today. They're actually both alive. I think uh, Steinberger is like 90, but anyway. So this is the experiment. And what's really important about this experiment was the technology. And the technology was the way to produce these muon neutrinos here. And the idea is, again, very, very simple. You take protons, you shoot them on a target, a bunch of pions come out. And uh, if the proton has some momentum this way, the pions predominantly have momentum going that way. The pions will eventually decay into muons and neutrinos. So again, the muons and the neutrinos are predominantly going that way. You put a bunch of stuff here. That stuff will uh, eat up anything that's not a neutrino, because the neutrinos don't interact very much. And then you put your detector over here. And that's how you do that experiment. You can be a little bit more clever. You can try to uh, focus the pions so that they're all really going that way instead of going everywhere. But that's the general idea. And that's how we still make neutrino beams today. Sometimes we care about having only pi pluses or pi minuses. That's where this focusing is a big deal, because if you focus a pi plus beam, that tends to defocus a pi minus beam and so on. OK, so the last part I want to mention about the story is uh, the fact that as, so this then, so the 1956 is the discovery of the electron neutrino. This is, uh, I forget what it is, 1962? Yeah. That's the discovery of the muon neutrino. If you keep going in time, in the 1970s, we discovered the third generation. The tau was discovered. I think it's 1974 or 1972, and I can't remember which one is which. Doesn't matter. And as, long, as soon as people discover the tau, they said that there has to be a tau neutrino as well. And uh, we're very, very sure that the tau neutrino existed for lots of different reasons. OK, good. And, uh, and, you, and you know about this. We know that there's a tau neutrino because of LEP data. That's data from the 80s. We're very sure there's a tau neutrino because of cosmological measurements. They measure how many different types of neutrinos there are, and the answer is approximately three. But what you would really like to do is to ask, can we see a tau neutrino scatter off of something? And how do you do that experiment? Okay, And that turns out to be a ridiculously hard experiment. 
for lots and lots of reasons. So the first observation of a tau neutrino hitting something happened in 2001 when all of you were actually already a sentient beings. Not just born, but born and kicking. Okay? And uh, it's a really hard thing to do. Uh, and that's the way you do it. Okay, so you have, to, you have a tau neutrino. It has to do something, so it hits something, and it produces a tau and something else. So that's what you'd like to see. There are lots of experimental challenges here. One is, the tau is really heavy, so you better have a pretty high energy new tau. That's one challenge. The second one is, how do you get new taus? And that's hard, but you know how to do that. You need a, a, a D sub S, you know, a strange a charm uh, uh, mesons, because they can decay into taus, or bees, if you like bees, if you like that sort of thing. So you need to have a high enough energy to produce these are uh, uh, heavy mesons, because heavy mesons, just like pions, like to decay into muons more than electrons. They like to decay into taus more than uh, muons or electrons for the same reason. Except that the tau is really damn heavy, so you don't gain as much as you hope you would gain. There's a phase space suppression that's not insignificant. But that's how you produce the taus. So now you have your tau neutrino beam. It hits something. It wants to produce a tau. So how do you see a tau? And again, that's getting into uh, experimental stuff. But the way to do it is pretty clever. The tau decays in a, a large variety of ways. And uh, the, the decay that people like is a, a, a decay into a muon. So the tau will decay into a muons are good because they're easy to detect. So you build a detector where you can see the tau decaying into a muon. And here's the important part. You have to see the tau move a little bit. So the neutrino comes in. It's a fixed target experiment. So the neutrino comes in. It hits something, produces a tau, which moves a little bit. And then the tau decays into a muon and two other neutrinos that you don't see. So this is the thing that you look for, is nothing happens. All of a sudden, a track appears in your detector. It moves a little bit. And then it goes on into another track. Okay. And all of this is in a very dense environment because you need a very dense target. So you have to find a detector that has great tracking resolution. And that's ridiculously hard. That's why people use very old techniques for doing that. And that's what's displayed in this figure here. These are the first four tau neutrino candidates that were identified in, and presented in 2001 by something called the donut experiment, which is a great experiment name. And this stands for direct observation of new tau. <laughs> so here are these really good events. So this is a, uh, this, this here is about a millimeter. So this is some fraction of a millimeter. This is a, a neutrino comes in, produces something that decays into a muon. The same thing happens here. The same thing happens here. And the same thing is happening here. That's really hard to see. Okay. But these are the four first candidates that were presented. Now the question is, why is this so hard? This is hard for lots of different reasons. One is, of course, you have to measure these tracks really well in a very dense environment. So you have these emotion detectors, which are very, very, very precise, but they're awful to, to analyze the data from. Basically, it's the type of experiment that you have to leave you. It's kind of like a photograph. You have to leave your detector there. You shoot your neutrinos through it. And then you take your experiment and you develop it. And then you reconstruct the tracks. Now, the reason this experiment is really hard is because as all of this is happening, remember, you worked really hard to produce a lot of tau neutrinos. In the meantime, in the same beam hitting the same target, you're producing a ridiculous amount of pions and kaons. Those pions and kaons are happy to decay into all kinds of other neutrinos that you could not care less about. So your tau neutrino beam is about, I can't remember, it's less than 10% new taus. It's way more everything else. It's not 10%, it must be a lot less than that. I can't remember the number for the life of me now. So you have this new tau that you want in a really crazy environment with all these other neutrinos going through your detector at the same time. 
this guy has a really hard time producing a tau. The other neutrinos also have a hard time doing something, but they do it much more frequently. And all of this is happening in a detector where you have to expose your target to the beam for a long time. So what your, what your photograph really looks like is this. So this is the data that you collect. You have all of these tracks. And remember, you're looking for one track that looks like that. And this is this really hard process of uh, uh, cleaning this out and, and trying to identify which tracks are correlated with what. And it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing experiment. And it's really hard. And uh, I do want to say the first results are presented in 2001. Their last results are such that they've identified nine tau neutrino events. That's the world sample of tau neutrinos. That's not true. The OPERA experiment has also seen tau neutrino events. I think by now they have six. So altogether, we have seen 15 tau neutrinos do something. I want you to compare that to Higgs bosons. We have seen a lot of Higgs bosons do stuff. We have not seen tau neutrinos do a lot of stuff. OK, so this is all I wanted to say, because I'm over time. So I will continue next time. So uh, before you disperse, I have one last question. I know you have the last lecture by Marcus this morning already, but uh, Marcus said very kindly uh, to offer himself available for discussion and questions uh, between now and six. So whoever is interested can...